Hello and welcome. In this video, I will be talking about human behavior and how it affects the decisions of individuals. For a long time, economists have assumed that individuals act solely out of self-interest and act always rationally. But in reality, this is sometimes not the case. Humans tend to act also in others' interests as well and are not always rational, not calculated. So, behavioral economics uses some of these behavioral insights to see how humans actually act and incorporates this in economic models to see how this affects the decisions of individuals and specifically in this video I will be talking about the decisions of employers and employees and how they are affected by the behaviors of, of the others. Specifically I will start by talking about the gender wage gap, how it comes into existence, what it is and how it persists to this day. Then I will talk some about the motivation of employer, employees and how this is affected by trust exhibited by employers and the behaviour of employers. And then I will talk some about the behaviour of labour unions, how this is not always purely out of self-interest. And finally, I will conclude by talking some about job search decisions of both the unemployed and the currently employed. Let's talk some about the gender wage gap. The gender wage gap is concerns the unfair compensation of men versus women in jobs, such that the average gross hourly earnings of men are higher than women often, and it of course differs between industries and occupations. But over the last 10 years, it has diminished, but unfortunately it's still existent. Now there are some rational reasons for why this gender wage gap exists, being for instance, that females often tend more to family responsibilities than to men, so they have less time to pursue their careers. But also, they can become mothers, and when females leave for maternity leave, once they return to work, they average, on average earn a lower wage than they did before. So this is one of the reasons as well. Now, another reason is that part-time jobs are more dominated by women than they are by men and they are often paid a lower wage then. Now, from a behavioural standpoint, there are also some reasons for why the gender wage gap exists. To start with is the view of the employers, because employers often view as females as potential mothers. They feel that they can leave at any time and therefore are less committed to the job. And this causes them to pay a lower wage to the females, even though they that this less commitment might not be true, but they feel that way because they have the feeling that they could leave at any time for, for say, maternity leave or family, other family reasons. Now, because females can indeed tend to other family responsibilities, they have less face-to-face -face time with the employees, once again giving an idea to the employees that they are less committed to the firm. Another reason might simply be the preference of the employer. Often, employers have some irrational preference of, let's say, males over females, causing them to, if they have to hire a female, they pay less wage to this female, regardless of if this female is even just as productive as their male counterpart, or even more productive. Now, let's say this firm was in a perfectly competitive market, say a firm that has computers just next to it, that do the same thing they do, so customers can go to the other one, to the other firms right next to them, if they wanted to, then this gender wage gap could not persist in this firm because they would have to hire the most productive worker and not based on preferences. But when markets are not perfectly competitive, so let's say this firm does not have close competitors next to it, so customers can only choose them, they have the power to choose their employee, employees regardless of their productivity, so the gender wage gap can persist in imperfect markets. Next we will look at some behaviour of the women themselves, because this also can affect some reasons why the gender wage gap still exists. Now from a cognitive standpoint, women often on average tend to be less competitive and have less confidence than men on average this is. So they pursue careers that are not as competitive as some men, so they earn less wages because these most competitive careers are where you earn the most wage. And another final reason is the preferences of customers. Because customers can prefer to be served by, let's say, either males rather than females, then they pay less if the firm, 
they buy the product from has females in them. So this forces the firm to segregate their workforce to say that's one firm with only males and one firm with only females. So the customers will go to the firm with, with the employees they prefer and pay a higher price there or they will go to the firm with the employees they prefer less and pay a lower price there. So the firm with employees they prefer with the higher price paid will be able to pay higher wages to their employees to let's say the men that work there. So the firm with only females will be pay, paying less wage to their females. So this is also another reason why the gender wage gap may persist. And this can even happen in an imperfect market. Next, let's talk some about employee motivation, specifically how it is affected by the behaviour of employers. There are two basic types of motivation, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation concerns external rewards, such as higher wages and bonuses, whereas intrinsic rewards concerns things as loyalty and simply the pleasure of doing something for the firm or the employer. Now, it is not always easy to measure motivation and especially effort, but a lot of field studies and lab studies have shown that increasing external rewards such as wages in the first few hours, sure, it increases effort of the employees that they measured, but after these first few hours, these external extra rewards had very little effect, whereas intrinsic rewards, non-monetary rewards, had much longer lasting and better effects. So, Next, let's talk about monitoring. Because if a firm wants to offer higher wages to their employees such that they exert more effort, they would also have to monitor their employees to see how exactly how much effort they provide. But monitoring has been shown in a lot of studies to have a negative effect on employee motivation. So, on the one hand, the positive effect of these higher wages on effort are offset by the negative effects on effort of monitoring. So the overall effect then of these higher wages are ambiguous, whereas intrinsic non-monetary rewards increase effort much higher. An example of such non-monetary rewards are participation. If an employee is more involved in the firm, can participate more and has more control over the firm than before, they exert higher levels of participation, uh, exert higher levels of effort, sorry. But you have to be careful because if they are given too much control, this firm cannot be competitive as they have to, employees do not have the amount of experience and know-how that managers do. So increasing it a little bit of control is very good for employee motivation, but not too much control has to be given to them. But overall, more participation increases the effort of employees. Now let's talk about reciprocity. because. If an employee reciprocates, they give back to the employee basically what the employee gives to them. Now, for external rewards, this works up to a certain measure, but for non-monetary gifts, this works much stronger. But it has to be taken into account that negative reciprocity is much stronger than positive reciprocity. So when an employee is punished for exerting less effort of doing something wrong, Nextly, they will exert even less effort, and this has a very strong effect. So negative reciprocity has to not to be taken lightly, and punishing has to be taken care of and not be done too much. Now, let's talk about labour unions a bit. Because labour unions have different tasks, and for different occupations and different sectors, there's different labour unions. But the main task of labour unions is bargaining with employers, such with that the employees they represent get, for instance, higher wages or at least good wages, raise the minimum wages and have good working conditions. Now, if you look at it from a purely self-interested perspective, such as classical economics does, they would solely increase their, the which they represent, their employees' wages and not take into account if it's fair or if the firm actually suffers from this, but pure their self-interest. Now in reality, we see that this is often not the case. They often very much take care to see if it's fair what they ask for. 
and often also take care of third parties. Third parties being the unemployed. Because let's say they successfully increase the wages of the, which they represent, the, those persons, those people that are already working. This means that wages overall increase. And for unemployed people, it then is harder to find a job. Now, employee, the labor unions actually take care of this. They don't increase wages too much because this might increase the difficulty for these unemployed to find jobs. So this is some form of altruism and shows that labor unions definitely do not only act purely out of self-interest. Finally, let's talk about job search decisions and specifically how this is affected by impatience. Classical economics assumes that people value future money less than they do current money. They assume that they do this at a logical rate, called discounting rate, such that they value, say, tomorrow's money at a logical rate less than they do current money, let's say, the rate of inflation, because tomorrow you can buy less products with your same, the same amount of money you have today, because tomorrow the prices are higher. Now, in reality, however, people do not value this so rationally. A lot of the time, they are very impatient and they value current money much, much higher than they do future money, even if this is at an irrational rate. This impatience, then, has a negative effect on how good of a job, how good of a fitting job they find. Because if they take less time because they are impatient to find a good job, they will end up at a job that pays lower wage than they could have found if they had taken more time and more effort in finding a new job. But because they are so impatient, they find a job that offers less wage and is often also less suitable for them than had they taken more time. But now let's talk some about employees that are already at the firm. The decision of employees to find a new job than the one they currently have is called the turnover decision. And this decision is not only affected by the wage that is offered by their current job and the wage that is offered at a different job, but also by a lot of other factors, behavioural factors, such as the commitment they feel to the firm, the social network they have developed at the current firm, and also factors that are very much influenceable by their employers, such as equity, how fairly they feel they are treated at the firm. So this all affects job satisfaction of the employees, and the higher the job satisfaction at the current job is, the less likely they are to find a different job, regardless if, if this pays a higher wage. So, if an employer wants to keep their employees, they have to take into account the, um, the job satisfaction of their employees, if they want to keep them. Thank you for listening, and have a good day.